What is going on guys? Welcome back to the channel. Critical Overlord here. So this will be the spoiler review for Screen 5, Screen 2022, whatever you want to call it. Once again, it's coming to us from Two Thirds of Radio Silence, Matt Benelli, Oakland, Tyler Gillette, pinned by James Vanderbilt, Guy Busick, bringing back all of the returning OG characters or OG stars, Nev Campbell, David Arquette, Courtney Cox, along with a new crop of uh, Woodsboro victims for Ghostface to have fun with in this new entry. So again, taking place 25 years after the events of the original Woodsboro murders, another person has decided to don the Ghostface mask in an effort to attempt to uncover and bring to light seekers that were thought to be buried deep within the town's past going on from that we have a new sydney uh or someone who's going to be filling that filling that role i would say so melissa barrera stars as sam carpenter who has a very troubled past she is basically lured back to woodsboro by the uh start of this new ghostface killing spree that's basically targeting her uh same way you found out how sydney prescott was dealing with trauma related to her mother a, a, a year prior to the new Woodsboro killings happening in the original film where we learned she, her mother died and of course there was an ongoing trial regarding who she thought had killed her mother with this one you find out that Sam is the daughter of Billy Loomis you find that out very early on the way it's woven into the movie and the way they just let it flow and play out they don't try to be overly dramatic with it or anything they kind of just drop the bomb on you very early on you do find out how Sam found out about this revelation at one point or another when she was a kid she found out reading through her mother's old diaries and found out that her mother had a thing for this guy of course this tells us that billy cheated on sydney and this had to have happened either during the killings themselves in 96 or sh sh maybe even shortly prior to them actually taking place so what i would say is that whole entire thing is the way again it's done and executed is very um, it doesn't feel shoehorned again because of how they do it. It feels organic. It feels like it flows well into the events that unfold. And it again acts as the Marine Prescott subplot, the, the new Marine Prescott subplot, where you now have Ghostface taunting and using that against Sam throughout the movie. This allows her to have some very emotional moments with Jenna Ortega character, Jenna Ortega's character, Tara Carpenter, who is her younger sister. There's also some tension that you will see between Sam and some of Tara's friends most I think most specifically I what I want to say is I'm referring to Amber who's played by Mikey Madison she seems to have some type of grudge against against uh Sam I, I don't think they ever really actually touch on what it is other than maybe her just not liking the fact that she left Tara because Sam left town once she turned 18 and left left Tara behind with their mother Christina and she, in fact, when she found out about their father, that she wasn't actually their father's child and the actual child of Billy Loomis, the dad heard from Sam yelling at the mother and that's what caused the dad to leave. So the way Ghostface is using this against her is what they're trying to do is frame Sam for these new Woodsboro killings in an effort to spawn the true stab sequel that they think they are owed. So that is the motive that you have in Screen 5, which I think is very timely. It speaks to a lot of things regarding toxic fandom in a lot of ways, because you you come across them online. I'm sure you do. A lot of us who are on Twitter in the Scream community, we know of one particular individual who is like this, where they're just targeting the cast in very nasty tweets. And just, you know, this is basically like that, but very exacerbated. Now you're, you're going very overboard. You feel so entitled to a specific specific movie that you're out killing people in hopes that you will finally get that very sick and twisted but also very timely speaking to a lot of things regarding entitlement within fandom today and just how people they don't know how to separate art from artists a lot of time and they get too personal when it comes to things that they don't like a certain ip that they are a fandom of doing so in regards to the killers uh, Sam, of course, has a boyfriend, much like Sydney did, who is portrayed by Jack Quaid, Richie, and he is indeed one of the killers. He lies his ass off, saying he doesn't know anything about the stab movies. You find out that's a lie. The way James and Guy uh, built these new characters up, the way that Mindy in specific is done, again, she's like the mouthpiece of most of the, not most, but some of the audience members who like to piece together the movie before you watch it you get a chance to get a feel of how they're all having this great chemistry amongst them when they're playing with each other one scene in particular again this is with mindy is when she's down in the basement with mikey madison's character of amber uh and they're just playing off of each other so well about rules of surviving and just what to do and what not to do the way all of that is done and paced is probably some of the best pacing at times in the movie because again when they get to the final act it is a bit rushed 
Uh, Matt and Tyler do a tremendous job again of building tension and just delivering a lot of scares, laughs, humor, and heartbreak. You're going to be crying. Dewey Riley is the person that Sam goes to for assistance in this before Gail and Dewey get involved. He ends up getting involved out of uh, after having a phone call with uh, Sydney, who is again portrayed brilliantly by Nev Campbell, and. He just feels compelled to defend his town again, even though he's not sheriff. He ends up getting himself killed because he wants to play respects and play it smartly in relation to the events or the rules to survive a horror movie, insisting that he needs to finish off Ghostface by shooting them in the head. This ends up getting him killed, and that's what prompts Sydney to come back. And Gail ends up getting involved, and they are both there in the nick of things for the uh, in the thick of things for the final act. The chemistry between Cox and and uh, Campbell in this film, I would say, is on another level, and the way. They are just, you know, that 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 death of Dewey, while I don't think they spend enough time letting them process it, this adds a a cushion underneath that bond now. They are very much so much more tightly bond over that death. And the way they come together and get justice for Dewey in the end with the other partner from Richie's partner, Amber, because she's the one who killed Richie, they essentially take her out we see it in the trailer it's just going to be a very satisfying moment there's a lot of that and that in and of itself now that i see what they're talking about the way that's done that whole effect was just breathtaking to see they did a great job doing that brian tyler's score again adds a lot of emotional weight to to a lot of moments more specifically now dewey's death very gut-wrenching at times i was like that didn't just happen but then as the movie's progressing and gail even has a line at the end where she says she thinks she's going to write a book about the man who used to be a sheriff of the town it just hits you because dewey even though he was a very i guess the most expendable that lovable goof side of him is how he ends up dying and you gotta love how he goes out he goes out in true dewey fashion but it just makes the the style or the use of the trio in this one that much more powerful and emotional for longtime fans of the franchise because the two thirds that are now remaining their bond is rendered so much more tight and you also get a good final girl now with sam carpenter to carry us into the future of the franchise uh, again a lot of witty dialogue and a lot of dialogue that's self-referential and very much meta and referencing modern horror again i'm still going to give this movie a seven and a half out of ten also, with the knowledge of knowing that Sam is Billy's daughter, when you go back and rewatch Scream, you have to kind of acknowledge that some of that dialogue in the original film is now foreshadowing for the events that unfold in Scream 5. The events that unfold in this new chapter from Guy Busick and James Vanderbilt, they have essentially turned so much dialogue from the original movie uh into foreshadowing for things that happen in this latest entry and i think that was another clever little thing that was intentionally done on their end the kills in the movie again i'm not going to say they're very memorable you get a lot of brutal ones the most brutal i would say was indeed judy hicks outside of her front yard that caught me off guard i would say there's a lot of callbacks to the third movie for sure with that sequence where she's running back to her house or driving back to her house to save Wes hicks from his inevitable death but the thing about it is the way it's done i'm so caught up in the moment and the way that they have you on the edge of your seat hoping that this mother can of course save her son she basically is killed so she ghostface catches her off guard and it just i knew it was coming i knew she would die in her front yard because of the tv spots but it's just like i wasn't expecting it to go down like that. it's the way they still filmed it that caught me off guard and it was just very brutal the fact that he did that in broad daylight and the other thing that I want to say is just that this is the first time we've had a pairing of killers who were on the same page all the way through. They did not turn on each other. You have a lot of franchise first for this new entry that I don't think a lot of you should overlook. You may not like the fact that Sam is Billy's daughter, but again, the way that it's done, it's not done in a way that feels shoehorned in. The reason it does not feel shoehorned is again how they decide to treat it. They don't decide to prolong it for to be something you learn in the end of the movie this is something that you already know the killer already knows it all you're waiting to now know is what does this killer want to do with this knowledge and you find out that again it's related to them wanting to get the true stab sequel that they think they are deserved because they have a disdain for all of the other sequels that have come before since the original stab i think i guess that's the only one that they love the other thing that i want you all to probably acknowledge and think about is the fact that you now have a trilogy that can be deemed the billy loomis trilogy or just the loomis trilogy you have screen with Billy Loomis you have Scream 2 Mrs. Loomis Debbie Salt and now you have Scream 3 the daughter 
and grandchild of those two who is nothing like them. She is your new final girl. They're doing a lot of flipping on the head of other core cliches and other things that they've already done before in the franchise, such as the fact that you already had a secret child with Roman Bridger, but Roman was the villain. Sam is not the villain. There's just so many things that are being flipped on their head to allow this to still remain fresh. The motive is probably the freshest it's ever been since Mickey in Scream 2, as far as like the fact that it's Amber and Richie, they are just completely insane. And while you may think that Amber and Richie were predictable and that's who you called, the way it's all still executed makes for a fun ride. You are going to have a good time watching this movie. There's The humor is there. It's not ill-timed. The humor just flows with everything else on your screen. Nothing feels like a cue for laughter. The humor and the laugh just come very naturally. Uh, the thing that I loved the most during the final act was just all of the insanity going on. But I wish they would have let certain parts of it breathe because it was kind of just speeding through. It felt like they were trying to rush through because they knew the credits were coming up. Uh, but maybe there's some extended cut out there that we'll get to see because you have a group a group of survivors that are going to carry us into an interesting direction i would say they take enough risk to give you a group of characters that you'll want to see carry the mantle into the future so you have mindy chad uh and no you have mindy chad sydney and gail and then you have jen ortega's character of tara carpenter and then sam carpenter in melissa barrera so you have like six people there uh mindy chad sydney and gail and then yeah tara and sam so you have like a, a group of six survivors there's some other people that survived they weren't that important so i'm not going to count them <laughs> but yeah the motive this time around again was the most freshest out of the bunch uh in terms of just how they recreated the whole mocker house i thought that was great the look of the film and the serious more darker serious tone that they go for works a lot for me personally because i felt that the tone was uneven at times with scream 4 feeling a little too hokey uh Mark, Bar Brian Tyler again he does a great job at trying to recreate some of those famous and notable pieces from Marco Beltrami such as Sydney's Sydney's Lament uh you hear that at times in the film and you also get to hear the, the red right hand song again that's back in full effect a lot of the characters yes are just here for the sake of being killed but you're gonna have a good time with this movie I enjoyed it the look of the film and the more serious dark tone he was going for I thought it was a good fit you know this isn't a direct a you know this isn't a film being directed by Wes Craven because they have a very unique style to them. And I, what I like is just the fact that they were doing their own thing while paying respect to what came before, and that's all they needed to do. They didn't need to try to be uh, like Wes in any way, but they they did it in in a very solid way when they were trying to do it. The first shot of the movie, even in with the house, the, the Carpenter house where Jenna Ortega's character Tara is waiting inside to start having that brilliantly done back and forth with Roger L. Jackson, who is in his bag again in this movie over the phone. That first little shot does a great job at establishing a lot of uh, mood and atmosphere, I would say, for what is about to unfold in that house. The way they use a lot of the background environment to kind of make you as the viewer pay attention to those things and just build constantly doing good things to build up tension. There's at one point even in the part where west dies where they are just like they're they're playing with you they're having fun playing with you you know it's coming but you're on the edge of your seat just waiting for it to finally happen they do a great job of just toying with with the fans this is a movie again from fans for the fans and they understood what the f they were doing i have to say that the other thing i want to talk about of course is melissa barrera because i've seen that a lot of people yes are, are praising jenna ortega and jasmine savoy brown everyone as far as performances is solid overall i would say it's not it's not completely consistent with good performances. There are some things where I'm like, oh, you could have done that better. You could have delivered that better or you could have just done better overall in general. So like Melissa, I would say she's consistently just giving a solid performance and a very new side of what we can expect to see in a final girl. So Sydney, again, was very much so someone that we would consider like the girl next door. Sam has a much more darker, edgier side to her that isn't fully uncovered in this one. You'll get to see that play out more, hopefully, if we get more entries and hopefully we get to learn some more about her criminal past because she does have that as well. But Melissa Barrera, she manages to evoke a lot of emotions. Her and Jenna Ortega do have great chemistry when they're sharing the scene together. It's nice to see that sisterly bond form between them as the movie is progressing. Uh, and they just kill it. They kill it. Everybody is hit, hitting it from all cylinders. It's just not all. It's just that the performances are not consistently good. There are some parts I'm like, oh, that was a bad thing to do. Uh, or you just weren't that good at that point. But everyone overall is in their bag. They're hitting it. And some of my favorite performances did indeed come from just another side note from uh, Sonya Mar, who played Liv McKenzie. She unfortunately does not make it out of the movie. She is like the first person to die during the final act before Amber and uh, 
Richie start unfolding and con trying to make their plan complete. What I do love is how if you go back and rewatch the movie, there are a lot of cleverly placed Easter eggs for you and surprises and cameos such as Skeet Ulrich. Uh, since he's back as Billy Loomis and Sam has hallucinations of him there's a lot of cleverly placed things that are in this movie and the other thing that they do so good is with how they have Sam hallucinating about Billy and with the de-aging of, of Skeet you can tell it's CGI but at this stage in the game you know the times are in I'm not gonna say it was a bad job he looks he, he looked great he looked he looked like how he did in 96 as close as you can possibly make him look so I like that and the 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 fallacies for me in terms of the writing just comes with of course hospital staff uh <laughs> just some writing mishaps and but the, the the pros come from the fact that you give us characters who do have their own little traits about them that make them stand out in ways not everyone is developed enough to the point where you'll care about their survival or not i've already said that in my spoiler free review i believe uh they do a great job at giving you things to to pinpoint on when you rewatch the movie for instance then also there's a cleverly placed easter egg that i will say for people who want to know if Kirby Reed is alive. There is a moment when Richie is on his computer and in his video recommendations on the right, you see a video title come up that says interview with survivor Kirby Reed, which was definitely one of my favorite Easter eggs from the film among other things. So Kirby is indeed alive. Hayden wasn't back, but maybe she'll be back for future entries at this point. Cause at night, now we at least know that radio silence are indeed very big fans of that character. Cause they recently revealed this on the podcast with that Ryan recently did who runs the screen podcast. Shout out to you. So hopefully she'll be able to come back and mix it up again with Ghostface and these new group of characters that we have. Cause I think Kirby would have a very good very good amount of scenes with uh jasmine's character mindy who is also a big horror nerd and she's just she's gonna she's gonna be one of the most lovable characters out of the new group of kids uh this new group of survivors is the most diverse honestly it is but let me know what you guys think about this down in the comment section below if you haven't already of course make sure you subscribe turn on post notification you never miss a video in the description i have links to my social media accounts my facebook twitter and instagram you can message me there of course to let me know if there's any movies news or reviews you'd like me to cover in the future and with all that in mind guys i will see you in the next video